In this video, I want to wrap up the section on principal components analysis by discussing a few limitations of principal components analysis. And these are limitations of PCA in particular as it applies to source separation and really particularly as it applies to neuroscience data sets. It's possible that these limitations also apply to source separation in other fields but I'm only going to be making strong claims in this video about neuroscience because I have a lot of experience with neuroscience data sets and I have very little experience with uh, data sets of other fields and using PCA and also other kinds of methods. And I hope that you get from this video not a negative feeling about PCA, but more a, a, an excitement and enthusiasm to go on to the next section of the course. So one of the main limitations of principal components analysis is that the eigenvectors are forced to be orthogonal. The reason why this is a limitation of PCA for source separation is that sources in the brain are rarely orthogonal. So you're more likely to have a pattern like this that is not going to be well reflected by PCA. And the reason why I make this claim is if you think about cognitive processes and you think about neural processes, think about neural computations and neurophysiology, there isn't a whole lot of orthogonality in the brain. In fact, there is a whole lot of correlation and correlational structure in the brain. And here's just a you know simple illustration of this. You have sensory perception and decision making, so internal cognitive deliberative processes, and motor planning and motor execution. Now, these are three distinct processes, sensory perception, decision making is like having to do with plans and expectations and, and values and rewards and so forth, and motor movements. But obviously, these are all highly related. You use sensory information to make decisions, and your decisions guide your actions. So these are separate cognitive processes that can be studied independently of each other. But it's crazy to think that these are orthogonal processes. So something like PCA is not going to be able to separate these kinds of cognitive processes or their neural representations. A second major limitation of PCA has to do with what PCA considers to be important in the brain. And basically, PCA is just equating variance with relevance. So from the perspective of PCA, something is important, a feature in the data is important if it has more covariance across different variables. So if you have a data set that looks like this, PCA will return as the, the first vector or the, the rotated data set will look like this. Now, again, this isn't wrong. This is the right solution for what PCA is designed to do. But perhaps you as the scientist, you know that what's really important in this data set is color. So you know something about the world and you bring that knowledge into your experiments, into your data analysis. So if you know that color is important, then PCA is simply not going to return the color direction in this data set. Certainly not in the first principal component and also not in the second principal component. And in fact, in many data sets, the features of the data that have the largest variance are the artifacts in the data. Those might be eye blink artifacts, they might be EMG, electrical muscle activity, they might be electrical or mechanical noise. There's all sorts of artifacts in data that are much that have much higher covariance than the features of the data that you tend to be interested in. This is related to the third limitation of principal components analysis, which is that it's not really amenable to hypothesis testing. Principal components analysis is designed to maximize this expression here, the quadratic form of the covariance matrix S. So what is the null hypothesis? It's an interesting question, and it's not immediately obvious what the null hypothesis is here, but I encourage you to pause the video and think about this for a little bit or discuss it if you're watching this with other people and try and figure out what is the null hypothesis that PCA is testing against. So the null hypothesis is that this S covariance matrix is the identity matrix and the identity matrix is 
the linear algebra version or analog of the number one. So if this is the identity matrix, then this is just weight uh, the w transpose w over w transpose w, which is just one. So w is or lambda is equal to one for every possible value of w. So that's the null hypothesis of PCA. And the way to interpret that is that there is no structure in the brain. Nothing is connected to anything else in the brain. Every neuron, every synapse in the brain is completely uncorrelated with every other neuron and every other synapse, every other circuit in the brain. Obviously, that is a ludicrous straw man null hypothesis, which means that PCA is really not a useful approach for testing hypotheses. And of course, testing hypotheses is really the, the, the main way that science progresses. So I want to be a little bit softer on this take home message because I do not want you to leave this section of the course thinking that PCA is awful, it's terrible, it's useless, it's no good. There's nothing you can do with PCA that's worth doing. That's really not the case. PCA is a great tool for what it's designed for. One thing that PCA is good at is determining the practical dimensionality of the data. And this is different from the rank of the data. PCA will tell you how many important dimensions of information are contained in the data matrix, whereas the rank of the matrix will just tell you the number of linearly independent columns. So for example, you could add noise to data and you would get full rank, but you wouldn't really increase the number of principal components. So I, that's not what I wrote here. What I wrote here is that PCA is great for reducing the data dimensionality or compressing, sometimes called the data dimensionality, from the original M dimensions, which might be channels, to C dimensions. And this is the important point, where C is larger than one, but less than M. So let's say you have a large data set of some imaging data with 10,000 pixels. Now, 10, 000, a 10,000 pixel data set is really large. It's cumbersome. It can be difficult to work with. And once you get to the non-orthogonal eigen decomposition based source separation methods that I will explain in the next section of this course, it can be very difficult to get good solutions with a 10,000 dimensional matrix. So therefore, in a situation like that, PCA would be really great to reduce the dimensionality of the data from 10,000 to, I don't know, let's say 100 or 150. And then you would do all of your subsequent source separation analyses on this 150 dimensional data set. In the next section of the course, I will call this two-stage compression and source separation. But the important point here is that PCA is theoretically and empirically, we'll demonstrate this in the next section, suboptimal for source separation where c equals one. So if you're going, if you're compressing down to one dimension, basically PCA is pretty much always going to give you a suboptimal result that is likely to be not very good, but also very easy to improve. And that is what you will see in the next section of this course.